name is Russell Tucker Seeley, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I am the Edward L. Snyder Assistant Professor of Gerontology in the Leonard David School of Gerontology here at the University of Southern California. Um, the title of my talk today will be Defining and Measuring Financial Wellbeing and Research. I'm not presenting a paper, but it's really an overview of my program of research um, and introducing you to a study that I have um, conducted. Um, and so, an overview will be an introduction to our program of research and background on financial well-being and health, issues with defining and measuring financial well-being, um, and a discussion of the Money Health Connection Study, in particular the overview of survey of our survey development, um, preliminary data analysis, and then also some data analysis next steps. So my program of research is motivated by a few key questions. First, how do we, and by we I mean public health, population health researchers and practitioners, conceptualize and operationalize financial well-being in research across the cancer continuum? Um, now that I'm at the School of Gerontology, I'm adding more chronic diseases here, so thinking about the chronic disease continuum <coughs> from prevention to end-of-life care. And what are the specific components of financial well-being associated with outcomes across the cancer or chronic disease continuum? So in an effort to better understand um, the pathway between health outcomes and financial well-being in general, my research focuses on the, the cancer continuum or the chronic disease continuum, and I use this continuum because I think it provides a really useful framework for thinking about research from efforts in prevention to diagnosis and treatment and survivorship and to end-of-life care. This framework also allows us to focus on the notion that different aspects of one's socioeconomic circumstances are relevant at different periods depending on what the individual or family is managing. For example, in the prevention area, thinking about the socioeconomic factors that are relevant for cancer risk-related behaviors, such as physical inactivity and smoking, might be different from the factors that are relevant during treatment and survivorship. Thus, the context for measurement becomes an important element of understanding the factors associated with the outcomes of interest. So a long history of research in social epidemiology has shown a positive association between socioeconomic status and health and health behavior, where socioeconomic status is generally measured with indicators of income, educational attainment, or working status, or occupation. But research in social epidemiology has also suggested that these traditional measures of socioeconomic status may be limited given variability within groups. In particular, there may be variation in individual vulnerability to the effects of adverse socioeconomic circumstances or to changes in socioeconomic circumstances. In addition, certain aspects of socioeconomic status may be experienced differently across racial and ethnic groups. The diminishing returns hypothesis suggests that socioeconomic status increases, for example, in levels of education, that the level of improvement in health is not the same for blacks as it is for whites. Another hypothesis is the minority poverty hypothesis, would suggest the unique disadvantage for racial and ethnic minorities living in poverty, that is, the disadvantages that both racial minority status and poverty bestow um, might be different for this particular group. And this is generally attributed to racial segregation, where racial and ethnic minorities are sorted into neighborhoods with fewer resources that facilitate good health. There are additional theories or frameworks or explanations that have been used to help us explain differences in health outcomes across social groups. For example, there's the materialist explanation of health disparities, which suggests that it is the differential access to tangible material conditions from basics such as food, shelter, and access to services and amenities that contributes to the differences in health outcomes across social groups. There's the psychosocial explanation of health disparities, which suggests that differences in factors such as status, control, and social support at work or at home, resulting from being in the lowest socioeconomic um, status group, contributes to differences in health outcomes across social groups. There are cultural and behavioral explanations of health disparities, which emphasize differences in factors such as beliefs and norms and values that individuals within specific social groups are more or less likely to engage in health promoting or damaging behaviors. There are life course explanations of health disparities, which emphasize the notion that events and processes starting before birth and during childhood may influence both physical health and the ability to maintain health, as well as emphasizing the importance of considering that health and social circumstances influence each other over time and over the lifespan. And the fundamental causes explanation of health disparities emphasizes the factors that put people at risk for risks. And 
this theory asserts that, so, that socioeconomic status involves access to important resources that allow individuals to avoid diseases and their consequences. In particular, resources such as wealth, knowledge, skills, power, and social connections. Now, I present these theories and frameworks to encourage us to ask what theory informs the research questions we ask about differences in health outcomes? And what informs our selections of measures of socioeconomic circumstances? Social epidemiologists Nancy Adler and others have emphasized the generations of health disparities research, with the first generation being focused on describing differences in health outcomes across race and socioeconomic status groups, the second generation focusing on the gradient in SES, where those at the lowest SES have the worst health outcomes and health gets incrementally better, better as you increase socioeconomic status. The third generation focuses on health outcomes, on how do social factors get into the body, it's how does the social factors get under the skin to impact health. And the fourth generation focuses on improving our measurement of social factors, the intersectionality of sociodemographic characteristics, and actual investigations of public policy solutions to reducing or eliminating health disparities. That is, how do we achieve health equity? And the research I'm discussing today has focused on the measurement of socioeconomic resources, and specifically on financial well-being. So even outside of the context of managing a chronic disease, many households in the U.S. are feeling financially insecure even before entering the healthcare system or managing that chronic illness. In a report by the, Econo um, by the Economic Security Index Project at Yale University, 17.8% of respondents reported feeling economically secure in 2012. And given the Great Recession that we're, that we're coming out of, it's also not surprising that 44% of households report that they have no personal safety net that is, with savings to cover three months' worth of expenses, and are living in what's called liquid asset poverty, according to the study by the CFE. Now, several concepts of financial well-being, such as financial hardship and financial distress, have been used in research and practice, focused on the influence of socioeconomic um, circumstances on health. Research conducted by me and others has shown that financial hardship, financial distress, financial strain, and financial burden of care is associated with, se with several health outcomes. In particular, the use of intensive end-of-life care by terminal cancer patients, poor oral health outcomes among poor older adults, poor self-rated health among low-income housing residents, delaying or foregoing medical care, health-related quality of life, multimorbidity, and mortality. And in my studies in particular, it is after controlling for traditional measures of socioeconomic status that is education and income, there remained a strong association with health, suggesting that our traditional measures may not be cap adequately capturing the variability that socioeconomic circumstances is contributing um, to health. Reggie? Um, yes. So for the intensive end of life care, is that sort of an unusual case where more intensive may not be better if it's not always concordant with the patient's wishes? Um, or could you say a little bit more sure. about that? Yeah. So ask your question again. Is oh, sure. <laughs> no, I was just wondering, so you were saying that there's a relationship between financial strain and people choosing to purchase more intensive end-of-life care. Do you think okay. that's a good or a bad? I mean, in the sense of sometimes there's too much intensive end-of-life care compared to what the patient would have wanted. Yes, and, well, and two, thinking about the decision-making process and, and how patients are making those decisions. So are they yeah. making the, the decision because it's hospital-based care mm -hmm. and so that it's covered? Potentially covered by insurance. Okay. Is it really the will of the patient, or is it something that the family is pushing? Mm -hmm. So, what is that decision making process? And so, in our patients or our households, exhausting all of their financial resources for care that is not really beneficial. So, while studies on financial hardship, financial distress, financial strain, and I'm using all of these terms. Um, on purpose just to highlight the fact that we use a lot of different terms to describe what we think is the experience um, or that we all assume we are describing the same experience. Um, while these studies have been helpful in identifying a specific aspect of financial well-being correlated with health, these studies have not used the same measures for the same concepts and expanding this construct to include other financial well-being concepts presents many challenges. So financial well-being across the cancer continuum presents challenges such as how do we define it? 
What is this experience that we think we're capturing with these measures of financial distress, financial hardship, financial strain, economic stress, financial toxicity, or whatever term you choose to use? Um, and then how do we measure it? And when do we measure it? And, and if we're talking about in, in the treatment context, are we measuring it as soon as the patients enter the treatment facility? Are we measuring it upon follow-up visits? Are we measuring it during survivorship? Who measures it? So there's, a, there's a lot of discussion, particularly in the medical oncology literature, around having cost discussions with patients, and patients report wanting to have that cost discussion with their physicians, and physicians report not wanting to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, what do we do with it after we measure it? So prior to coming to um, the faculty here, I was on the faculty at the Dana Barber Cancer Institute, um, and several physicians would talk about, okay, yes, we can measure financial hardship, but what are we gonna do? If we discover financial hardship in our patients, um, what is the intervention, what, what do we, how do we write a prescription for a patient reporting um, financial, financial hardship? And then does it look the same across racial and ethnic groups? And now that I'm at the School of Gerontology, I'm asking, does it look the same across um, age groups? <laughs> so in response to some of these questions, in particular in the prevention context, I was thinking about how we measure um, financial well-being, or financial hardship, financial stress, economic strain, um, in the context of cancer prevention, um, I developed the Money Health Connection Study. And the aims of the Money Health Connection Study were to determine the association between concepts of financial well-being and self-rated physical and mental health and cancer risk-related behaviors, is physical inactivity and smoking. And our research questions were, are financial well-being concepts differentially associated with those self-rated health uh, measures and cancer risk-related behaviors? And then are the domains of um, financial well-being, uh, material, psychosocial, and behavioral, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about those domains in a minute, are they differentially associated with, um, with our outcomes? Um, and the goal of the Money Health Connection Study, which is primarily what I'll talk about here today, uh, was to develop a transdisciplinary conceptual model of financial well-being and to develop an assessment tool to measure this construct. And so why is this necessary? Um, in particular, there's a lack of conceptual clarity on a financial well-being concepts, so I've mentioned them several times, financial hardship, financial strain, economic stress, financial toxicity, these, these terms that we use oftentimes interchangeably um, without a lot of um, um, sort of indication or being explicit about what they mean. There's also a lack of measurement clarity, so across these terms, there's no consistent measure uh, for how we capture these particular concepts. And without such clarity, intervention and policy development are hampered as we aren't exactly sure what we are intervening on if we haven't defined and measured it accurately and consistently. So the Money Health Con uh, Connection Study was implemented in five phases to develop a conceptual model of financial well-being and a survey to measure the <coughs> in the context of cancer prevention research. And the phases included a transdisciplinary literature review where we reviewed over um, 1,700 articles, um, focus groups, we conducted four focus groups, um, two low SES focus groups and two higher SES focus groups, and those um, socioeconomic status here was defined by educational attainment. Then an expert panel, um, an expert from each of the fields that we reviewed in our um, um, uh, transdisciplinary literature review, um, cognitive testing of the draft survey, and then a pilot test of the survey. So the transdisciplinary literature review was a review across social and behavioral science fields of the various ways financial well-being had, excuse me, had been defined and measured. So we, we reviewed research in psychology, sociology, public health and medicine, economics, family and consumer science, and for those of us that are a little older, we might remember that's called home economics, um, and, and social work. And we started the literature review with a definition from um, a book by Strumpel, where financial well-being refers to the material and psychosocial aspects of one's economic situation and describes how well an individual is making ends meet and if he or she has the financial resources to handle unexpected um, life events. We also included notions of relative socioeconomic status, that is how one compares or how we compare ourselves to others that we view as socioeconomically similar. So surprisingly or not surprisingly, across fields, there was little consistency in the conceptualization and operationalization of financial well-being terms. Though three themes were evident in the description of, um, of um, in the 
uh, definitions and measurements that we review in the articles. Um, and in, in particular, informed by the theories of health disparities that I, that I described earlier. So um, it was sort of, we sorted the, order, the, the measures that we found in the, in the definitions that we found into, into these domains, into the material, the psychosocial, um, and the behavior. And our working definition of financial well-being following the literature review was that financial well-being referred to this overarching construct that captured the financial resources that one has or has access to or the material, how one feels about those resources, so the psychosocial, and what one does with those, with those particular resources. And then based on a preliminary or hypothesized group of, groups of, con group of concepts at the beginning of the study, the following terms were selected based on their frequency in the literature and what we thought captured the definition of the domain, um, the material, the psychosocial, and the behavioral domain, so face validity for those particular domains. And our model was informed by the material and psychosocial explanations of disparities that I mentioned earlier. And originally, our model really only included those two domains. We were really only thinking about the material, that is, the financial resources people have, and then how people felt about those resources, and sorting the terms into, into those particular domains. However, once we reviewed the literature in family and consumer science, what we realized that what we had left out was what people do with those resources. How do they manage the resources that, that they have? And the family and consumer science literature um, had, had several measures um, and had defined that particular domain really well. So, for our focus groups, this model was presented to the focus groups and the participants were asked if they agreed with our three domain model and if it was missing any aspects that they thought of when they heard the term um, financial well-being. And across the groups, there was support for the three domain model of financial well-being. In particular, the, the group supported the notion of that the model should include aspects of being, meeting one's basic necessities and incorporating emotional and behavioral dimensions. That is incorporating how people feel about their resources and incorporating what people do with, their, with the resources. There was some uh, disagreement on whether or not the arrow should be bidirectional, and there was also some disagreement on whether the domains should overlap, or whether there was a linear pathway that is from material to psychosocial. The conceptual model was also reviewed by the expert panel. The expert panel consisted of individuals who had con conducted research in the area of financial well-being from each of the fields where the um, conducted our literature reviews, so as I mentioned, psychology, sociology, public health medicine, so an individual from all of those fields participated in the expert panel. And what became very clear from this process that there is a lot of inconsistency within and across fields. If you can only imagine trying to get a group of those of you that are economists in the room, trying to get a group of economists to agree on something, trying to get a group of people across fields to agree on this construct was very, very challenging. So while my original plan was to provide some conceptual clarity to how these terms are used, <coughs> I thought it was evident that the greatest contribution I could make here would be to ensure that we at least got these domains right, that is the material, the psychosocial, and the behavioral, over whether the specific term was correct, given the, given the large number of terms and the challenge um, of getting people to agree. However, it was clear that, from at least from the psychology literature, um, and the use of the term financial hardship versus financial distress and stress. Um, for example, use of the term but material or financial hardship often, but not always, referred to the lack of hmm? referred to the lack of material and financial resources, and financial stress and distress referred to the psychological response to that lack. And during the review, we also selected um, the three or four best measures for each concept that is based on its frequency in the literature and also psychometric um, properties of the measures that were, that were presented, and the expert panel reviewed the best measures for each of the concepts within each of these domains. So again, while I was hoping to gain consensus on the measures selected by the expert panel for each concept, we decided on majority rule. Um, based on the results of the expert panel review, we took those items along with the other constructs that we plan to measure in the Money Health Connection Study, and then we performed cognitive testing of the draft survey, and then cognitive testing was conducted on a small sample with a facilitator to ensure that the respondents actually understood um, each of the questions. Um, we recruited um, a sample from Craigslist um, from the Boston area, 
Um, questions that were added after the after cognitive testing, and as a public health researcher, I can't believe I left off health insurance, um, but health insurance coverage was added, and also public assistance, so whether individuals were on welfare or uh, received any sort of public benefits. So I developed a video to describe the financial well-being construct and the conceptual model developed as part of the Money Health Connection study, and here is an excerpt from that video. <laughs> It is well established that socioeconomic status is positively associated with health and health behaviors. Yet, population health research on this topic has often relied on simple measures of socioeconomic status, such as income, that may not adequately capture how socioeconomic status is actually experienced and lived. For example, two individuals can report the same income on a survey, but they might live that income very differently. They may have different household expenses, different <coughs> levels of satisfaction with that income, and different levels of additional assets that help to buffer financial challenges, such as spending more money than is coming in, or financial shocks related to unexpected costs, all of which may impact their health, health behavior, and how they navigate healthcare. A useful construct that can help population health researchers and practitioners capture how socioeconomic status is experienced by individuals is financial well-being. The tucker Seeley conceptual model of financial well-being includes concepts across three domains. A material domain that captures the financial resources one has access to. A psychosocial domain that captures how one feels about the financial resources one has access to. And a behavioral domain that focuses on how one manages those financial resources. For example, if we know that these two individuals with the same income have different levels of financial well-being, then we know that they are experiencing their comparable level of socioeconomic status very different. That's an excerpt from the video to help um, describe um, our conceptual model of financial well-being. Um, so some example questions from our survey. Um, in the material domain, there were a total of 17 questions. And an example question during the past 12 months, how much difficulty have you had? Um, in, in paying your bills. For those of you in, um, in public health, you'll be very familiar with this question. It's a question that's, that's often used that is um, developed or was developed by Leonard Perlin that was then informed by work by, by um, Conger and his group. Mm -hmm. um, and then the psychosocial question, there are about 24 questions in, in that domain. And financial worry, how often do you worry about not meeting your expenses with your current, with your current income? And then the behavioral number of questions, around 30 questions. Um, around family resource management. Before I buy something for myself, I compare prices on similar items. I have a plan for how I use my money, and I follow the plan for how I, um, how I use um, um, my money. And the total number of questions includes, includes questions with multiple parts. So some of our questions had you know, A, B, C, D, and that number includes um, those multiple parts. So there were a total of about 71 questions. Again, some questions have multiple parts. And our primary outcomes of interest were self-rated health, self-rated mental health, smoking behavior, and physical um, activity behavior. A different additional constructs measured, um, personality characteristics, um, fin a financial health scale. So we included, included questions from the Federal Reserve's um, financial health scale. And we um, look to compare our items to the items that, that are used in that particular scale. Um, high effort coping, or John Henryism, for those of you who are familiar with that particular construct. Um, and also symbolic capital symbolic capital of consumption, which was um, added to the psychosocial domain, which is a construct that was developed by Dr. Elizabeth Sweet, um, which is um, sort of our outward presentation of our socioeconomic status and how important that is to us. That is, how important is it for you to present what your level of socioeconomic status is to others? Um, and then temporal orientation. So for the pilot study, we used our professional and personal networks to advertise the study. Um, this, this study was conducted while I was on faculty at the Dana-Farber in the Center for Community-Based Research at Dana-Farber. So we set up a Facebook page for our lab and posted it there through LinkedIn and our, all of our previous collaborators through the Center for Community-Based Research. Um, and we also used MTurk, an Amazon marketplace for recruiting workers. And in this instance, workers were uh, survey participants. Um, and so our total uh, sample was 629, with approximately 200 individuals were recruited from, from MTurk. Um, our preliminary analysis was, of course, descriptive and univariate statistics, a bivariate analysis, um, and then some uh, measurement analysis. 
So our sample characteristics, our sample was primarily white. 84% um, of the respondents were white, 9% were black, 92% um, were non-Hispanic, about 76% um, were between the ages of 21 and 50, um, 76 were married or living with um, a partner, about 80% were working for pay or full time, um, and about 73% um, were college graduates, um, and 40% or I'm sorry, 28% had an income of 40,000 to less than 60, and there was actually six, um, six percent had an income of over 100,000. Um, so this was a high SES um, sample that is primarily white, highly educated, relatively high income, and mostly um, married or living with a partner. So for each of the questions and each of the domains of this material, psychosocial and behavioral for this preliminary analysis, I was really first interested in using all of the questions for each of the domains. And so before we began the process of reducing the items within each domain, we summed the questions within each of those domains, and we recoded the questions so that the lower score, at first, this was just the easy, easiest route, um, recorded, we um, coded them so that the lower score meant a better well-being. I, I realize that's confusing, and I've given this talk and talked about it, and we're in the process of trying to recode it just to make sure that the higher score means um, better well-being, but just know, sort of for this presentation, the lower score means um, better well-being. Um, and so here are the means for each of the domains. The range is 0 to 42 for material, 0 to 46 for both the psychosocial and material. Um, and the coefficient is the ratio, of course, of the standard deviation to the mean. Um, it's just a measure of dispersion. So for the material, the mean was 19.69, psychosocial 24.92, and for behavioral, um, 24. And the, um, the domains were highly correlated, so material to psychosocial, 0.70, statistically significant, material to behavioral, 0.64, and psychosocial to behavioral, 0.73. Correlations with the financial well-being domains and income, um, um, point, minus 0.46. Um, so again, as, um, as the score goes down, that's better for financial well-being. Um, and so um, psychosocial and income, minus 0.14. But for the behavioral domain, it wasn't statistically um, significant, um, and that correlation was only 0.03. So for our bivariate analysis, um, there's no statistically significant difference in mean scores for men and women for the material domain. Um, there is some, some public health research that, that shows, especially for the financial hardship variable, that there is a gender difference in the reporting of financial hardship. We didn't note that um, in, in this particular study. Respondents over 50 reported better material financial well-being than respondents under 50, and respondents with a college degree or more reported better um, material financial well-being than respondents with some college or less. So psychosocial, no statistically significant difference between men and women. Respondents 50 or over reported better um, psychological financial well-being and respondents with a college degree or more reported better psychosocial uh, financial well-being than respondents with some college or less. And then for the behavioral, again, no difference between men and women, but non-whites reported better behavioral uh, financial well-being domain than, than white, so that's a curious, I'm eager to sort of further explore uh, that particular association. Um, respondents over 50 reported better um, than those under 50, um, and then respondents with a college degree reported better, um, and then married respondents reported um, better uh, than non-married respondents. So I began working with the psychometrician um, at this stage of the analysis for the measurement analysis and so the data, the data set was randomly split into two groups, and the exploratory analysis was conducted on the first half. Um, we investigated whether the data supported a general financial well-being factor, that is whether or not our, over our idea of an overarching construct of financial well-being would hold, and we used the smith lyman transformation, which did not support a general factor, as the factor loadings on the general factor were lower than that um, of group factors. So we just explored uh, the psychosocial domain, and so we just um, were checking for the evidence of a strong um, general factor for this particular domain. Um, and so for this one, we, were, we used parallel analysis to determine the initial number of factors, um, and then we used unweighted least squares exploratory factor analysis with an Oklahoma rotation. Um, and the <coughs> items were eliminated if not loading on factors that is less than three, or cross loadings that were not conceptually supported. 
So from the measurement analysis of the psychosocial domain, we had a three-factor model. Um, and so that three-factor model was financial worry and perceived stability of resources um, hung together, financial satisfaction, and then symbolic conception. And about 68% of the variance was explained with this three-factor model. And so for the first model, it included these kinds of questions, that is, um, perceived um, stability of your resources that is compared to 12 months ago, which you say is difficult for you to buy groceries, and then also measures of financial worry, so thinking back over the past 30 days, were you worried about your financial matters? And the financial satisfaction questions were how satisfied are you with your level of living, how satisfied are you with your current level of savings, and how satisfied are you with your ability to meet uh, large emergency expenses. And then the last one was the symbolic um, consumption questions. And doc, I mentioned this was a construct from Dr. Sweet, and she had not developed measures for this area. She'd only done qualitative research um, in talking to um, um, sort of low income, actually she, did, she conducted a study in Chicago with low income um, housing residents. Um, and we looked and searched for measures that actually captured some of the themes that she found in her qualitative work. And we actually found some measures in the marketing literature. And these measures are about sort of people's ex outward expression of their socioeconomic status. And that is, mm. I feel that by buying name brand clothes, I can describe to others who I am and what I am. Mm. And I feel that by buying name brand products, I can be more popular with others uh, and like-minded successful people. Mm. So our next steps for data analysis includes, um, there's a six month follow-up. So with the individuals that conducted our, or that completed our survey, um, we contacted them six months, uh, we asked them if they would um, be interested in completing the survey six months later. About 80% of our respondents agreed to be, um, to be surveyed, and so we have six month follow-up data. We're also interested in looking at the correlation between the financial health questions developed by the Federal Reserve and our financial well-being domains. And again, um, further exploration of this symbolic consumption question, I'm really interested in sort of people's um, sort of display of their socioeconomic status and, and whether or not how that could potentially be associated um, with socioeconomic factors and also with their health and health behavior. Mm. And then continue to um, reduce the number of items within each of the domains. So I just sort of briefly presented the psychosocial domain that we explored, but also exploring the material and the behavioral. Um, the behavioral domain is one that we were having the most amount of trouble with, as that one was really not, those questions were not hanging together at all, so we're still in the process of exploring those. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, we did this transdisciplinary literature review where we um, found all of these measures of uh, financial well-being, and I, this study took much longer than I anticipated, and I talked to my program officer, and I mentioned to her, this has taken so long, but we have all of these great measures. And as I was talking about this, pro this project, I would consistently get emails from folks asking me what is the best measure of financial hardship, what should we use if we're measuring you know, perceived adequacy of resources. And together with my program officer, we decided to put the, med the results from our literature review um, online. So we developed a, repos a repository to include um, on, my, on, the, on the website that I'll go through um, here in a second. But I also wanted to talk about um, sort of the the primarily white and the high SES nature of the sample in which we conducted this study. And so I'm also eager to explore sort of using this, um, this survey in a more diverse um, sample. In particular, low-income housing residents is a, is a place I'd like to explore, and also a socioeconomically diverse racial and ethnic sample and among older adults to see if we get the same results um, that we got in this high SES sample. So on my website at tuckerseely.org, um, you can go to the measure section. And across these domains, I have, uh, it's kind of blurry, but so in, in, if you click on each of those domains, there are the concepts that were listed in the model that I, that I had in, um, in an earlier slide. So things like making ends meet, perceived adequacy of resources. If you click those links, you will find the best measures that we found in the literature for each of those concepts and decide um, what measures are most appropriate for the study that, that you're using. So, so yeah, so for example, here for making ends meet, you have, or for the material domain, you have making ends meet, economic material, financial hardship, and family and household, or family and household financial resources. So if you click on the making ends meet, then you go here, and then that's the, that's the measure um, that's on our website. So what are the implications for thinking about financial well-being and cancer prevention research? Um, um, specifically, and then um, I guess public health research generally. I think better explication of the socioeconomic factors associated with health and healthcare across the life course, and also I think identification of potential intervention targets. That is, if we are thinking about 
um, sort of the, the socioeconomic uh, factors that are influencing one's health and health behavior, for if those factors are related to the financial resources that people have, then we can capture those with more material measures. If the impact is on how people feel about those resources, that is they're stressed and they're worried about the lack of resources, then perhaps a psychosocial response is more appropriate for the intervention. But if it's about how people are using their resources, then it's more of a behavioral or coping related intervention that can focus on things like financial literacy and financial education. So in conclusion, I think if we are to effectively address socioeconomic disparities in health outcomes, it's critical that we improve our understanding <coughs> of the material, the psychosocial and the behavioral dimensions of household financial well-being that describe how individual socioeconomic circumstances are actually experienced, managed, and leveraged along the pathway to various health outcomes and health behaviors throughout the life course. So I have to acknowledge my funding sources. This was funded by an R21 project while I was at, in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and my, my research lab staff while I was at Dana-Farber includes these individuals, um, and also um, a lot of help from the Health Communications Corps and the Survey Data Management Corps at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Robin Yabrop, and I am an epidemiologist and health services researcher at the American Cancer Society. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here to have the opportunity to talk about uh, Reggie's presentation, but also I really enjoyed for the past day and almost a half learning more about what people are doing outside of cancer. I tend to work <coughs> exclusively. Right, thank you. I tend to work exclusively in cancer, so it's really useful to think about um, what other things, what other people are doing, and how to apply some of those interesting methods and techniques in cancer research. So, um, so I'm talking about Reggie's talk. It's defining and measuring financial well-being in cancer research. What do we know and what do we need to know? And I should also um, disclose that Reggie and I have worked together in the past, and we're we're also friends and. So take that as my comments. So a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I don't, you can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the main goals of the presentation was to think about conceptual and measurement clarity and um, an extensive literature review, focus groups, um, lots of cross-disciplinary conversations about what is financial well-being, and I think that's something that, um, you know, certainly this paper is, has done a very good job with. The Money and Health Study, which uh, preliminary results which Reggie presented, I would say my only concern about that is the use of convenient samples and a, a well-advantaged population. And so I, I really can't not say that as an epidemiologist. I'm, I'm very interested in what is a nationally representative sample and um, as I was thinking about this, I realized that I can actually help understand the effect of what that convenient sample is, both in terms of prevalence estimates, but also in associations. So the different measures of financial well-being, or what I call financial hardship, um, what does that look like in a national sample? And I'm going to share some of those data with you. Uh, and then because this is a new and evolving field, I really do want to focus on what we know already, but also Importantly, what we need to know and, ha and what are the levers we can use to try and minimize financial hardship and improve financial well-being. So I'm going to use the same similar sort of um, framework, which has uh, material conditions, psychological response, and coping behaviors. You'll notice that rather than having um, arrows going back and forth, there's, there's the opportunity for some overlap in this model. Um, but I also want to point out that I usually refer to it as financial hardship as opposed to financial distress, financial burden, um, financial toxicity, which is also something that's used a lot in oncology. Um, it's, it's, so this, this, this first slide I'm sharing is national data from Medical Expenditure Panel Survey. And I'm showing material financial hardship, and it's measured in this survey by things like borrowing money going into debt, um, troubles with paying bills, any other sorts of material financial sacrifices. The main thing I want to point out here is the difference in the age. So in the population age 65 and over, you see very little variation. The level is low, but you also see little variation by type of health insurance coverage, whereas in the younger population, 18 to 64, 
um, much higher levels of material hardship and uh, variation by insurance coverage with the highest of them being uninsured. Um, so this is similar to what Reggie showed us that in third, third. In his highly selected, well-advantaged sample, there was an age effect, and I think also there was uh, some so other socioeconomic effects too. One thing I do want to point out in this slide, though, is this any private, which we might think of as people being well advantaged in terms of health insurance coverage, 25% of poor comes from medical bills, um, medical debt, and are unable to cover the share of the medical costs. <clears throat> and this next slide is from um, the National Health Interview Survey, which is a large nationally representative survey. And there are a number of questions in the National Health Interview Survey that can be mapped into those, those domains, material, psychological, or psych psychosocial, and behavioral. And um, in this slide, really the question is, what is, what is hardship intensity? So if people experience more than one component of these domains, what, what, what are the characteristics associated with hardship intensity? Um, and on the left, this is educational attainment. The main thing I want to point out is that 47% of those without a high school degree report multiple domains, that means more than one, uh, domain of financial hardship um, compared to 34% with a college degree. Similar to what Reggie showed, association with educational attainment and financial hardship. Um, the health insurance coverage one I think is especially interesting. If you look at the uninsured, 60, I should say this is only 18 to 64 because that's where we see the most variation in financial um, the uninsured, 68% report multiple domains of financial hardship compared to 34% of private health insurance. So thinking about what are our levers, what can we do to address financial hardship, improve financial well-being, insurance coverage may be, may be a really interesting place to go. Okay, so in national data and in, in the highly selected convenient sample, Socioeconomic position and health insurance are associated with hardship. Um, but really, we have a lot of recent trends towards increasing costs of care, um, especially for cancer care. I'm sure many of you have heard of these new cancer drugs. A couple hundred thousand dollars a year, and some increasingly a couple hundred thousand dollars for one treatment. So, so in cancer especially, there's a huge focus on financial hardship and um, financial well-being. We're also seeing a lot more patient cost sharing, a lot of high deductible insurance plans, uh, greater use of co-insurance, higher co-insurance rates, especially for specialty drugs, and then finally increasing prevalence of underinsured. So they, people may have health insurance, but it may not cover very much. And with a lot of the short-term plans that we're seeing more recently, and the sort of encouragement of this administration for enrollment in short-term plans, that many of which don't cover prescription drugs or maternity care. Um, so we're seeing high problems with people who may not have insurance coverage to help um, with any unexpected uh, health conditions. So really the concern, especially here at a, at a conference focusing on health equity, is potential for increasing prevalence of financial hardship um, and widening disparities. Um, and so I want to come back to the slide that Reggie presented, um, which I thought was so, such a nice way of thinking, how do we think about financial how do we define it? How do we measure it? When do we measure it? Who measures it and what do we do with it after we measure it? Another, another way of thinking about what do we need to know, what do we know already and what do we need to know, is thinking about the different levels that affect patient financial or affect risk of financial hardship. And here in the center um, is the patient and the family, followed by the provider and the provider team organization, local community, state health policy, national health policy environment, all of these factors can affect whether a patient has high risk of financial hardship. But these are also potential levers where you might intervene to reduce the risk of hardship. I want to point out that I've also included the employer as a level here because employers make decisions about whether to offer health insurance coverage to their employees and they also make decisions about what type of coverage and then whether or not they offer paid and unpaid sick leave. So when you're thinking about these multiple levels, here's a series of questions, and this is more in the what do we need to know um, part. Is financial hardship associated, is it associated with health literacy? Is it associated with decision making around 
around treatment. And at the provider and team level, who is the best member of the provider team to talk about cost and risk of financial hardship with patients? I'm not convinced it's the oncologist, perhaps it's another member of the team. The practice and health system um, is there a way to document risk of financial hardship? And can we use things like electronic health reminders or prompts to encourage conversations about hardship? And then finally, at the policy level, can health insurance coverage and benefit design, can it be structured to minimize risk of, of um, hardship, but also can it be structured to minimize risk of, of disparities? I'm gonna share a couple more slides. They're all pretty similar. We use data from 40 states to look at um, insurance coverage and diagnosis for newly diagnosed cancer patients. We look at expansion, non-expansion states. Not surprisingly, better insurance coverage for newly diagnosed cancer patients in expansion states compared to non-expansion states. Also, earlier stage of disease with diagnosis. So, so you know, the things only going through 2014, we still are seeing some important changes for cancer patients. The reason I'm showing you these slides is because we looked at what the effects are among patients with historic disabilities. So in expansion stage, you see that um, compared to earlier years in 2014, the disparity between rural and urban diminished or it, it eliminated compared to non-expansion states. Uh, if we look at poverty level, we also see disparities, disparities diminishing um, in expansion states compared to non-expansion states. And then finally, if we look at race ethnicity, we also see disparities diminishing um, in expansion compared to non-expansion states. And so when we think about um, status of expansion, this, this is from September 2018, we'll see what happens in the coming months in terms of the cost. But I want to sort of point out that these sort of darker states are the ones that have not expanded. And um, this is a map of cancer mortality rates. This is just a little men. It's mm. 2002 through 2011. Um, I, I want to really emphasize where the highest rates of mortality are is the red. And just to think back again about what's going on with <coughs> states that are not expanding. This is before Medicaid expansion. It's based on what I showed you about what's happening with diminishing disparities in states that expand in comparison to those that don't expand. I think we can expect to see much higher rates of mortality or more disparities in mortality. So I recognize that I took us a little bit beyond, <laughs> but I, I thought this was very interesting to share at this meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. So that quote that you had from the 1970s talked a lot about basically if I had a shock, would I be able to withstand that shock financially? Yeah. And I wonder, in the case of cancer care, people don't even know how big the shocks might be and right. how much income risk um, is related to cancer care. And so I wonder, how do you think about financial well-being in yeah. a case where people don't even know the financial risks? Yes. And it might vary a lot amongst people of different SES. Yes, yes. And so, and I think it also presents challenges that neither the physician nor the patient are clearly aware of what this is going to cost. Yeah. And so the challenge also becomes then if neither party that's involved knows what it's going to cost. And most of us are not very comfortable talking about our financial situations. And so in some of the uh, other focus groups that I've done with, with social workers that were working in the cancer setting, what I found is that um, for individuals or for social workers who are comfortable talking about finances, that those individuals were also more comfortable talking with patients about finances. But for those who seem to be less comfortable about it, talk about connecting patients to services. And so they didn't even get to talking to patients about their own personal financial situation. And so I think sort of Robin's questions about sort of who on the team is going to talk to patients about this issue is an open question that we haven't quite figured out. So who's going to talk about it? And what is the content of that conversation going to be? Um, and, and I think your, your, your point is well taken that we all sort of enter this experience with varying levels of socioeconomic status, varying levels of financial literacy, and various levels of financial resources that we can tap into as we navigate that experience. And, and we, we, are, we aren't very really comfortable talking about those resources either. So there's some research sort of looking at the resources that people have 
and they you know, sort of buy a house. And I, there was a, a study by a researcher at Brandeis that conducted some focus groups in, in St. Louis. And he was asking families like how they got the resources to, to pay for their house. And it was obvious that the families had, some families had tapped into familial wealth in order to move into neighborhoods that were good school districts for their children. But to get them to actually admit that took hours. He had to dig and dig and mm. dig to get to people admitting that their parents had given them you know, these large down payments to pay for homes to move into school districts that were better for their for their, um, for their children, and that tended to happen more for white families than for black families. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, um, a possible extension and also tying in with something from yesterday, um, you know, uh, Ben's talk about people not understanding health insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. I loved, um, I, I saw sort of a tie-in with your research that, um, I wonder if you'd be interested in doing sort of a horse race between the objective measures of things mm -hmm. like health insurance coverage or objective, you know, fin financial well-being with purchasing power, et cetera, mm -hmm. versus um, the subjective measure. And I wonder which would be more predictive of, um, you know, healthcare utilization, the impact of health insurance on health or or health outcomes in general. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so we're trying, making sure that we aren't sort of putting yeah. them as sort of competing measures, I think mm -hmm. is, a, is a really important Way, way to frame it so that I think there are sort of pathways from these objective measures to to um, healthcare utilization and health, various health related outcomes. But I think one thing that, that some of my research has also shown is that these, these um, self reported measures of sort of how people feel about their resources, what they're thinking about their resources, how they're using their resources, are things that we, we could and should be including in, in our measures of, um, or our studies of that, that do include more objective measures of sensitivity. That's true. So, do you, oh. do you have another? Oh, no, I was, I, um, if, if I can follow up. Um, uh, I saw one of Robin's graphs showed that the financial well-being was the same for uninsured and public insured. So, um, so you're right, maybe not a horse race per se, but um, seeing that comparison, there could be some insurances that we thought were good on paper, but in people's experiences, surprisingly not. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. and one, too, I think sort of yeah. the, the different resources yeah. that, that we bring to bear in, in those various programs, so trying to think about sort of what additional resources to mm -hmm. um, sort of their, their level of financial literacy and navigating those various yep. programs, so we're making sure that we include those measures in our, in our studies in that area as well. Just to follow up on, on a bit of on Rebecca's, I think I think the, the the differentiation between something more objective versus subjective is interesting. I I, I kind of appreciate that probably it was very hard to make all those people from those different fields agree. In part, I think economists like to think about objective measures such as you know out-of-pocket spending as a fraction of your income mm -hmm. things like don't depend on how you see things and in part because if you think like you know you're then correlating this with mental health right and how do you think if you're depressed you're just more likely to see that the same expenditure might be oh my god this is terrible or if you have just mm -hmm. a different type of personality right. you might judge these things yeah. Yeah. differently. I'm not saying that's not important. I think yeah. it's just how I think different disciplines yes. look at and treat these things. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think, I think yeah. it's just I don't I think more of a comment of like how different disciplines yeah, think yeah, about I mean, financial well being as yeah, yeah. And I, I think that was one of the key takeaways from this exercise was being able to talk to people across fields mm -hmm. and uh, across fields and sort of how they thought about these particular um, these particular factors. Uh, one, of the, one of the points you, you brought up is about sort of, um, sort of whether or not people that are depressed are going to make sort of different, different decisions. And another area that I, that I hope to explore is thinking about whether or not financial stress is different from other stressors. That is mm -hmm. um, sort of how people experience sort of not having enough financial resources or, or having a, a shock in their, to their financial resources. And that's different from other types of stressors like racial discrimination or any other type, type of stress. We don't necessarily know that yet, but I think trying to figure out sort of whether this kind of, this type of stress is mm -hmm. different from um, sort of how people deal with it. And, and, and I think it is only because we don't talk about our, our finances. Mm -hmm. And so trying to figure out sort of where we're going to sort of ameliorate this kind of stress is going to be a challenge. And just another, uh, so you, you mentioned about like reaching out to different populations, populations that are maybe more vulnerable or to measure these things. We actually have here at USC, an online panel yes. where you can, you know, actually feel this kind of 
it's called the Understanding mm-hmm. American oh, Study, yes. the mm-hmm. UAS, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. and you can mm-hmm. actually, uh, you Add know, stuff. It, yeah. it's more expensive than the MTurk. Yeah, right. You, but, but you you have a lot of pre- like characteristics already, so you know their income, you know their race, you know their you know a lot of vulnerability yes. kind of, and then you can just field your Build questions it. to the idea. subpopulation mm-hmm. you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. You know their health, the, yes. all the HRS, the Health yeah. and Retirement Survey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, study kind of question type of questions is already there, oh, okay. so you can just recruit some sample of people right. that you're really interested yes. in. So, yes, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I I just have a quick comment on the out of pocket cost as a percentage of income. Okay. And I I I agree. Like having objective measures is important, but at the same time, for people who forgo care because they can't afford it, your that measure will be inaccurate mm-hmm. because they will not be right. spending that money out of pocket right. because mm-hmm. they can't afford it. That is care. true. And so they always need to be exactly. these measures always need to be looked at together with utilization measures. I completely exactly. agree. Yes. Yeah. So when we do I do some work on kind of effect of health insurance coverage on financial well being yes. and we there's always a point. You need to look at those things yes. together, like the spending and the no. I hundred percent agree. Yeah. And I agree with you too. <laughs> well, a quick point on Robin's point. There is more also in the global health literature around doing a need adjustment for financial risk protection and out of pocket expenditure. So I think um, in Indonesia there's some studies by Prada and Prescott that do that. So they adjust for underutilization. But I mean, I had a quick question about uh, maybe clarification on when you were showing the cross correlations on your dimensions and then the low correlation with income. I was wondering, because the low correlation is not necessarily showing a strong negative correlation with just low explanatory power. Right. So is that because it's not permanent income and it might just be current income? Or have you thought about looking at like wealth or consumption or other more permanent income measures? Yeah, we haven't really explored sort of why that, <coughs> that, was, that was there. We don't have any, any sort of wealth related, related questions. Um, so yeah, so we're still sort of trying to figure out sort of why that, that Do you think this measure, measure is the, the financial well-being is a measure of SES? I think it's a measure of sort of how SES is lived. So how we are experiencing the socioeconomic resources that we have available to us. So, so you wouldn't replace SES with... No, no, no. Okay. All right. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where, I mean, it's it's itself a useful measure, but in what context you would use it to understand other effects of programs. So often we use SES and we try to control for SES, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, what in aspects you would use this right. as, a, as a confounder. In terms of program participation or program effects? Program effects and other things, you know. Well, I, I, I think these kinds of factors might influence sort of program participation for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and maybe also sort of program, program effects sort of as people are, are navigating various programs, sort of whether how they feel about those, those particular resources and resources that they can access in addition to the program um, as they're navigating that. And then sort of their, how they use the, the resources that they have available to them in addition to the, to the program. So trying to figure out I think what specific um, sort of measures in which domain I think is going to be important. So there aren't going to be measures that you know we, we come together with this material psychosocial and behavioral measures that we use in cancer that probably are going to be has the, the same measures that we use that we are evaluating the welfare program or any sort of SNAP program mm-hmm. or any other sort of public program. I think it's going to be context specific, trying to think about mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. how financial how the financial well being of the household would potentially be impacted by this particular by mm-hmm. that particular. Thanks.